Hello and welcome to Water Cooler Conversation. I'm Nick Cater, Executive Director of the Menzies Research Centre. It's probably highly unlikely that there's anybody watching or listening to this conversation who doesn't remember uh, what they, where they were on the 11th of September 2001, unless, of course, you're possibly under 25 and, and you may not remember it. But for those who lived through that, it was uh, profoundly, uh, profoundly affecting. And it's affected, of course, the way the world has travelled since then. It's affected the course of uh, America has taken and us as their ally. And it's affected the way we live our lives in so many ways. One person whose life was profoundly affected by it is uh, Andrew Hasty, the MP for Canning, and he joins me now. Andrew, welcome to Water Cooler. Really good to be with you and your listeners, Nick. A lot of people will be familiar with with your story, but nonetheless, let's let's recount it and the and what what ha, what what nine eleven did to you and the direction you took in your life. Well, thanks, Nick. I grew up in Sydney, in suburban Sydney, in the suburb of Ashfield. I went to school uh, there, and then also uh, in the eastern suburbs as well. But when nine eleven happened, I was in my first year of university. I was studying philosophy and history at the University of New South Wales. I was thinking about being a journalist, particularly a, a foreign correspondent of sorts. And I remember distinctly sitting down to television. I'd often watched Late Line when it was half decent and also the, the late news with my father. We sat down together to turn on Sandra Sully. She was the, the one who broke the, the story about the first tower being hit. And we sat there transfixed for the next six to eight hours, I think, uh, watching the second plane crash in the building. Then, of course, the, the Pentagon and the Pennsylvania crash as well. And then finally, the towers coming down early in um, Sydney morning time. So uh, I felt at that moment that it was a hinge of history, that I had to do something. And this overriding sense that uh, my life was going to change along with um, the, the direction that the world was heading, heading in. So what did you do? So uh, I should add as well, Nick, that my year two and year three teacher, uh, the late Mrs. Julia Farina, she was my teacher at Ashbury Public School. Her daughter, Eliza Farina, was, was killed in the, the Twin Towers attack. And so for, for me, it wasn't just a terrorist attack on a distant shore. It also resounded all the way back to the inner west of suburban Sydney. Uh, so I felt, I felt like I had to do something. I, I watched the initial months of the war and I remember sitting in a university watching it as we sat around talking about international relations theory and um, watching students. This happened several days, um, the sub, several days subsequent to 9-11. To, to but students in a philosophy class mount moral equivalence arguments about how the US had it coming to them. And I just felt, OK, I've got to do something. Um, I thought about the Army Reserve, I, I joined the Army Reserve, and then over the next 12 months I decided that in fact the Australian Army was, was my vocation, it was going to be my vocation for the next decade or so, and I transferred to the Australian Defence Force Academy, finished my degree there, and uh, found myself uh, in 2009 in Afghanistan fighting a, a very different war to what it was in 2002. Yeah, so let's just go back on that. Um... It could be said to be a sort of spirit of useful enthusiasm that drove you uh, in that direction. I don't know how true that is, but have you ever at any point had cause to regret that decision you made? No, and there are a number of reasons why um, I wouldn't be the man I was today had I not been through um, the last 20 years through the variety of institutions the Australian Defence Forces put me through, the investment that they've made. I wouldn't have met my wife, Ruth, in 2007. Um, I, I wouldn't have had a formative experience in 2009 and 2013 in Afghanistan, which has in turn shaped my view of the world and my, and my politics particularly. Um, so uh, no regrets. Of course, there are, there are moments of regret over that 20 years period, and um, some of that's documented through the things that happened overseas in Afghanistan. But certainly, um, I'm, I'm proud of my service, and I'm grateful to all those who've helped me along the way. How tough was it to go through that training, 
which I know is very, very tough, uh, and then to find yourself in the field of combat? Well, ADFA and Duntroon have their own unique challenges, but in the end, they are great institutions which produce leaders of uh, small units in the Australian Army. And that's what I was. I went to Darwin for, for three years uh, at the 2nd Cavalry Regiment. We didn't have horses, Nick. We, we had light armoured vehicles, 13 tonnes each. They were eight wheels. Um, and I took a, a troop of cavalry to Afghanistan in 2009. And our mission over there was to mentor the Afghan army and to do reconstruction. So I spent a lot of time uh, driving around Uruzgan province with the commanding officer. I was his, um, his, his what we call uh, CO's TAC. I, I commanded um, his security detail and got him from A to B safely. So I got to see, I got to meet with people from DFAT. I got to meet, um, you know, Dutch commanders, American commanders, um, meet with Afghans themselves, uh, look at schools, hospitals, uh, pulled a lot of security. Uh, we, we, I think my troop hit four IEDs, uh, which destroyed four vehicles. Thankfully, no casualties. That's a testament to the quality of the Bushmaster vehicle, which was manufactured here in Australia. And um, I got a real sense of what it's like at gunpoint to try and build national institutions and the challenges that that um, posed for us over there. Um, then when I got back in 2010, I attempted SAS selection and that was really tough. And um, there's a phase of SAS selection, which is the middle phase and it's called Happy Wanderer, where they kick you out into the wild for about five or six days. There are about eight checkpoints or at least on my Happy Wanderer, there were eight checkpoints. And um, each of them was a peak and you had to walk about 180 kilometers um, over five days with 40 to 50 kilos on your back and no one talking to you the whole time. You didn't see anyone really. And uh, that tested your inner resolve to get the job done. And I remember getting to the top of a peak in the Stirling Ranges in Western Australia. It was ominously named Magog. And I got to the top of Magog and there was an instructor there and he said, well, why are you doing this? And it was a, a question to test my, my resolve. And I said, well, I've, I got back from Afghanistan last year and uh, the Taliban were, were blowing up my troop. Uh, I want to go over there and I want to hunt those guys. That was a pretty straightforward answer. So it was two different perspectives in 2009 and 2013 when I eventually redeployed. Uh, but certainly the training was, was tough, um, very, very tough. And again, it's character building and that's what we need in our defense people. There's no, there's no need for a spoiler alert on this particular story. I mean, we all know it's all far too close to us what happened in the last few weeks in Kabul. But if you, if you, as far as you can, Andrew, take yourself back to 2009 when you were engaged in, uh, in nation building. Were you optimistic at that point that it would succeed, that, that while Afghanistan would probably never become Belgium, uh, it, it might at least become stable enough for people to thrive. Yeah. Look, I went over there very optimistic. Um, I remember George Bush's initial speech when he went into Iraq. I remember his 2005 second inaugural address where he talked about freedom um, moving throughout the world and, and transforming societies. And I think I was quite naive. And when I got over to Afghanistan, I realised that geography... Uh, family and tribal links, uh, culture are very, very resilient. And uh, the challenge was to, to get the Afghans to, to buy into what we were, we were offering them. Now we built schools, we built hospitals, we built roads, which I know the people appreciated, but there's a couple of examples where I realized the limitations of what we were doing. Um, in the center of Tarancot, there was a bazaar or a marketplace. And um, north of that, there was a place called Sork Magab where we built a, a, another bazaar which was meant to be more secure and away from some of the, um, the, the bad elements of, of the Taliban in, in TK. And I remember going up there with my troop um, and I got out of the vehicle and I went to one of the shop owners and bought some pomegranates and, and a pallet of Red Bull, which was everywhere. And a lot of the, the shops were closed. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of trade going on. And it was a reminder that uh, trade and relationships pop up um, organically and spontaneously. You, you, central planners can't just make those things happen. And so I started to realize that um, people in Afghanistan will live their lives as they have for many years before we arrived and they'll live them 
the way they want to uh, now that we've gone. And that, in turn, has given me a healthy respect for local peoples in Australia, um, particularly our local governments. As frustrating as they can be sometimes, uh, they have an important role. And so I, I, I really have gained a respect for the sovereignty of, of local peoples. You, um, you spoke about your own naivety there. Um, was the West, was the United States and its allies, was George Bush, were they naive too to think that they could establish a stable country in Afghanistan? I think so. Uh, I've made the point recently that a lot of the veterans who are coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan are now empiricists. We're, we're tempered by experience. Um, I certainly subscribe to what people might regard a, a, as a, a form of Whig history or people have rebadged it, neoconservatism, whatever it might be, this idea that um, after 1989, in the unipolar moment when the Berlin Wall came down, the US was triumphant at the end of the Cold War, that somehow democracy would, would start to move its way through the world. Um, I think that was proven false. And in fact, someone said to me only a week or two ago that the withdrawal from Kabul was the death, the final death of the Enlightenment. Now, that might be overstating the case, but certainly um, I think I was naive and now I'm a lot more guided by experience. Sure, there's a place for ideas, um, but there are fundamental laws to this world and um, you have to respect them, particularly as a policymaker, I think. Now, for myself, I think looking at this, following this, from the comfort of my own armchair and my own desk, not right in the middle of it as you were for part of the time. I think it has taught me a lot about democracy. Uh, you realise that democracy, you know, the bit where you, the bit at the end where you you take your ballot paper, you put your cross, you drop it in the box is 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 just the final bit. There's a lot that goes into it up to then. Um, and in Hong Kong, for instance, you know, they've never really had a a free democracy in that sense, but there's really a sense that it is a free country or was until now. Have you been able to sort of put your finger on what the essence of a liberal democracy is? Um, I, I think there are three things, a, a love of democracy, and by that um, enabling even minority voices um, to, to, to have a go, um, even when they're not um, the prevailing view and unpopular. I mean, by definition, that's what a minority is. But having a love of democracy is critical. And I think um, upholding the rule of law is, is, is also an important ingredient. And then ordered liberty. Um, and at the basis of orbit, ordered liberty is, is self-restraint, self-government. And you've got to have that cultural foundation for democracy to work. And um, that's why what we have here in Australia is so unique. And I remember flying back from Afghanistan over our red earth as we flew over the northwest of the country. And I just felt this intense sense of being home and wanting to preserve what we have and feeling the fragility of things. Um, and that's, that's simply why I got into politics. Um, I, I want to conserve the good, reform the bad. In, and. Um, you know, that's why I, I pay credit to the last 20 years as being so formative for me. Yeah, the, you, you've already answered my next question, why you got into politics, but let's probe, probe that a, a bit further. Um, it, it, once again, you'd set yourself a huge task to reform the good, uh, reform the bad and, and preserve the good. Uh, that's easier said than done in politics, of course. Uh, how's that experience been for the last, what, uh, five years has, has it been harder than you thought have you do you feel any sense of achievement any sense of frustration fill, <laughs> fill it out yeah uh, politics is is better than you think and worse than you think and the the highs are higher and the lows are lower than normal life i guess to to sort of give you those initial thoughts um i didn't have any expectation about politics I, i'd never the I hadn't been to Parliament House since 1993 as an 11-year-old kid for the tour when, and then I, I, I rocked up after the by-election and uh, stepped into to the House for the first time in, in what that was uh, almost 20 years. And um, so I didn't have any expectations, I just took things as they, as they came to me. But I, I think the one thing is that I would say is that politics is a, is a contest. It's a contest of ideas, 
Um, it's a contest of networks, it's a contest of logistics, it's a contest of parties. And if you're not prepared to get up every single day and struggle for what you believe in and for your convictions, uh, then you're not going to get anything done. And that takes a toll on you, obviously, but it's a privilege to serve in that place. And, and that's why when I, I get up and start a new day, um, I ask myself, what am I fighting for today? Whether it's my constituents, it's, whether it's something to do with my ministry, uh, whether it's to do with a, a national issue or a, a, a value or a set of values, um, you're always fighting for something. And that's an important truth about politics. I remember, I think the very first time that that um, I came aware, became aware of just what sort of a man you were, was in that by-election when you were campaigning for the seat, and uh, uh, John Howard was with you, and uh, as you would expect, you know, you start getting those questions about religion from journalists who find the whole thing of faith uh, rather bizarre, uh, but you responded very well. Remind us what you said at that occasion, or the gist of what you said. Well, people were taking issue with my father and his theology. He's a Presbyterian minister. He um, has been for f f more than 40 years. And um, people were attacking my father and expecting me to throw my father under the bus and disown him and, and his faith. And um, I remember travelling down in the, in the car from Perth with uh, Mr Howard... Um, Danielle Blaine and Ben Morton and talking about this. I got out of the car to a big press pack and I was nervous. Um, it's very confronting when you've been working in the shadows to suddenly step out into the public square and have a hostile audience put microphones in your face and, and demand you answer questions. And um, I just said, look, you know, faith's an important part of, of our lives as Australians. And I can't remember exactly what I said, Nick, but um, I remember standing by my convictions. In fact, had I had the time again, I would have probably gone on the attack. Um, you know, leave my dad alone. How, how dare you attack my dad? He's a, he's a good man. I love my dad. I wish I'd been more forthright. I'm thankful for my dad for what he's done in my life. Um, and instead, I sort of took the middle course. So um, politics has changed. It's more vicious and um, weakness is provocative. So I think had I had my time again, I would have been stronger, in fact. I think the Prime Minister has demonstrated that very point. He, he has never shied away from his faith, his Pentecostal um, faith. And um, I, I think when he first became Prime Minister and, and the, the press first went on the attack, the usual suspects, uh, they thought they were onto a winner. But yes. I think they realised pretty damn quick it wasn't going to have any traction. No, people, yeah, pe people, people hate it when they go after uh, religion or family, those things which we hold near and dear to our hearts and are matters of conscience. And, um, you know, this is what makes Australia what it is. Uh, you can't just um, whitewash our history and pretend there hasn't been a Christian influence on our country. Um, I think it's a really important part of our history. And... Um, we should embrace it. And um, I've, I haven't shrunken from, from my own personal faith. Um, I'm, a, I'm a congregant member of the Mandra Presbyterian Church here. Um, it's, it's an important part of my life. It's where I go with my family every Sunday morning. And in as much as it's a worship service, it's also an opportunity to just step away from politics. I switch my phone off for, for, the, for the two hours that I'm there. I don't want to hear from journalists. This is an important thing I do with my family. It's, it's sacred, and uh, that's why I try and preserve it as best as I can. I think what I've come to realise, and, and this has been brought home to me by David First Roberts' new book, God and Menzies, is that um, more than ever I've come to see faith and uh, and political conviction and civic conviction is, is pretty much one and the same thing. You know, what, what that book does, of course, is, is demonstrate how, how Menzies um, spoke a lot about faith in quite a deep way. The Christian faith, of course, he was brought up uh, as a, as a, uh, for, from a Presbyterian background like yourself, but he, he also it was close to the Jewish community. He saw the great link the continuation between the Old and New Testaments, I think, very clearly. But, but the point I'm coming to on this is 
those values that were instilled in him as a child, love thy neighbour as thyself, uh, every person is equal before God, those precepts really came part of the party which you remember. You know, there were, there were all those ideas, even if we don't articulate them in that way, are deeply embedded in the way we think about our civic values. Would you agree with that? I, I do. And part of the Liberal Party platform is the, the dignity and sanctity of the individual. Well, that's a distinctly Christian idea derived from the Imago Dei, the, the belief that people are made in the image of God and therefore, no matter who they are, they're worthy of respect and you treat them with dignity. And um, that's, an enduring, that's an enduring idea um, that's in our political system as well. That's where the human rights movement ultimately derives its, its anchor. And um, so I, I agree with you. Uh, on the influence of, of um, the Bible and, and Christianity more generally, a lot of the great Western democratic leaders in our history and of other nations have been shaped by um, the Bible, whether or not they were professing Christians or not. Um, Abraham Lincoln, certainly, if you look at his second inaugural address, Winston Churchill um, was very well versed in the Bible. In fact, one of my favorite quips of his um, someone asked him if he enjoyed politics and, and he quoted the Old Testament and said, you know, one should never muzzle the oxen when they tread out the grain, <laughs> and, um, which I thought was just a ripper line. Um, and so, you know, Menzies is in good company. It's not as if he's a, an isolated figure shaped by Christianity. It's, it's part of the Western democratic tradition. And in fact, I'd throw Shakespeare in there as well. Um, many of the great orators, again, Lincoln, Churchill, um, Menzies, I think Troy Bramston documents this in his book. Um, Menzies used to retreat to Shakespeare in, in quiet moments. Um, Billy Hughes was, was into it as well. Um, all of them were shaped by the Western canon and Shakespeare and, and the Bible were a big part of that. The, um, you know, many loud voices in the media um, seem to be profoundly challenged by people of faith. They, they find it very awkward and, and odd, but What's your experience going you know, around your electorate or when you're out and about? It seems to me that most people, uh, whether they share your faith or not, uh, have, a, have a, just a, a deep commitment to freedom of religion. And if you believe that, that's fine. Um, I mean, here's an illustration of it. I mean, out of our prime ministers since Federation, those you can remember, were any of them non-believers, expressed non-believers? Well, one, Ju Julia Gillard, who was... I thought courageous enough to to say what her 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 position was, uh, but you won't find any others, as far as I can see. That, so Australian people seem to be quite happy, or quite quite comfortable with people of faith in politics, and perhaps they even um, prefer them because they know they're going to have a certain set of values. Is that your experience? Yeah, it's a it's a live and let live culture here in Australia, and. Um I can't remember whether it was uh, Thomas Jefferson, but as long as someone doesn't break my leg or pick my pocket, then I don't have an issue with it. And um, I think that's how most Australians uh, see faith. And you mentioned Julia Gillard. Um, we live in an increasingly pluralist society. I think people want um, people to be honest about what they believe. They want to know where their convictions lie. And so, yes, I too um, respect Julia Gillard for being open about where uh, her, her worldview um, comes from and where it's what it's shaped by um, mm. and I think in order to have a better politics in the future because the, the great sort of moral and social consensus of the last hundred years is starting to break down and I think the ABS data reflects that in order to have a better politics we, we actually need to understand each other and our differences more and um, that, that means we have to be more honest about what our presuppositions are about uh, reality, uh, our politics and what we consider to be the good. And when we put all that on the table, we can actually start having good arguments and then find ways to compromise so that we can live together peace peacefully. Um, well, after that rather longer interlude than I, I expected, it's been fascinating to talk to you on that subject, Andrew. Let's go back to Afghanistan. Let's go back to uh, the events of the last month. Um, I know from talking to other people who'd served in Afghanistan, either in, in uniform or in civilian roles, they seem to, it's, seems to have been like a profound kick in the guts to them, what's happened in Kabul. 
how did how did it how did you how did you take it it was really tough to see us just pack up and 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 leave so quickly and when i say we i mean the the, the coalition of nations who've been in afghanistan for the last 20 years i didn't expect it to happen so quickly um, as it turned out, our decision as, a, as Australians to leave in, 2000, sorry, in April this year, um, at the time we took criticism for it, but it actually set us up well for the eventual evacuation. Um, but the speed at which everything sort of came apart and the Taliban took over, it was very difficult to watch and confronting. And uh, all the gains that we'd made over the last 20 years were seemingly squandered. So I can understand why veterans feel the way they do. In a sense, for me, in 2009, I was already having doubts about what we were trying to achieve there through the nation building. I remember a US State Department official by the name of Matthew Ho, and if your readers or listeners um, Google his name, last name is spelled H-O-H, he published a letter and resigned very publicly um, in 2009. The Washington Post ran it. And I remember reading that letter in 2009, and it, I tell you what, it, it, it holds true today and it's, it's worth a read. So in a sense, um, I'd already started to have doubts in 2009, and by the time um, I left Afghanistan for the last time in 2013, I'd made my peace with the future of the country. And so when it, Kabul finally fell this year, um, I wasn't as devastated as, as some, but certainly it was really tough to watch um, a lot of people um, fleeing. It was it was really tough to watch those those young men who who were clutching to the wheels of the US C-17 and then and then fell from the sky, and it was tough working with a lot of the Australians um, or Afghans with Australian passports and those who had visas try to get out. And um, we got four thousand one hundred out, but there are still many out there who who are keen to to get out. And my thoughts and prayers are with them at this time. There's two schools of thought with possibly a, a, a degree of grey in between about about this. One is that we'd accomplished our mission, we'd, we'd gone in there to punish the terrorists, Al-Qaeda, we'd done that, we'd pretty much kept terrorism down for the last few years at least, apparently, um, and that it wasn't America's role to spend forever in that country. The other is that, well, um, hopeless as it may seem, with a bit more commitment, the sort of commitment we showed to uh, South Korea, for instance, uh, after the Korean War, we might have been able to turn that country around. Where do you sit? Look, I think um, we, we could have held on to modest gains with a very modest deployment um, going forward. Um, we had a 300,000 strong Afghan army and backed up by the US supply chain and logistics, it was doing a pretty good job. And if you look at the casualty rate over the last decade, from the coalition side, it was it was very small. It was a it was a modest cost for what we were achieving in Afghanistan. I think there's no such thing as perfection in this world, and um, you know, uh, an Afghan national government, imperfect as it might have been, I think is much better than a Taliban government in Afghanistan. And um, you know, we can go into hypotheticals and counterfactuals. It's probably unhelpful at this stage, but certainly I think um, we we. You know, we or the you know the countries that were remaining, the U.S. particularly, um, could have could have held on to some modest gains through a modest deployment of, of troops and, and other personnel. So, how do you how do you see the United States right now? Do you see this as a sign that they're retreating into some dreadful form of isolation, iso isolationism, something that would have profound consequences for a country like Australia? Or is it just really a sim simply a question of strategic repositioning? I think it is a strategic repositioning. I think the US will turn its eyes to the Indo-Pacific region. Um, if you think about Indo-Pacific Command, it, it starts on the west coast of the United States and um, its western boundary is uh, Pakistan. So think of it from sort of Hollywood to Bollywood, 50% of the US military is in the Indo-Pacific. Um, there's bases, of course, there's a strong presence. And uh, I really hope the US invigorates its position in the Indo-Pacific because uh, many nations, including Australia, depend upon a US presence as a force for good, 
they secure lines of trade, communication. Uh, they underwrite the, U, the, the rules-based global order with, with their naval power. And uh, my hope now, with Afghanistan in the rear view mirror, that they refocus here, because we certainly need them with the rise of China and the, the challenges that China are putting to the global order. The rules-based order is, of course, under severe threat. Um, we think of China chiefly, but there are other countries, of course, who are trying to pervert this. Uh, North Korea, Iran, Russia. Um, it does seem a, a bit like we're in that battle again for freedom, aren't we? But a, on the one side, people that believe in freedom, free trade, countries cooperating with one another, sovereignty, um, and on the other side, you know, some assertive countries that want to want to dominate by force if necessary. That's right. When the Prime Minister was here, I think it was in April, it might have been April or May, he, he spoke really well on this subject and, and, and said authoritarian voices are getting louder and more insistent. And we have a choice. We need to work together with the free world, with, with other democracies to secure what we have. We can't take this for granted. And uh, we need to constantly tend to the garden, as it were, of, of, of democracy. And uh, I think that's correct. That is where we're at. And in fact, the Defence Strategic Update of last year, uh, which the Prime Minister announced at the Australian Defence Force Academy, confirms that. And um, this is why ANZUS is so important for us going forward. I wrote last week in The Australian that ANZUS is a trellis and um, it's a framework for, for which we pursue our shared vision of freedom with the United States and New Zealand. And uh, the, the signatories of ANZA 70 years ago um, knew that. Percy Spencer, Percy Spender, rather, um, the Australian who signed it on our behalf, he said that we all share a common destiny, and, and he's right. And that this, the signatories also were tempered by the experience of war, World War II. They knew that freedom didn't just happen. You have to work at it, and you have to build alliances, and you have to, um, it's, it's more than just words, it involves statecraft. And uh, that's why the United States is so important to our region. There's been much commentary on the centre right about about weakening resolve, weakening values in the West. Um, that what's happened in the universities, this sort of virus of poor thought, if you like, that's come leaked out of the university labs and is affecting affecting all our conversation now about you know critical race theory we, we don't need to go through it we all know we all know the, the area uh, how do we fight back against that and should let's put that question more directly uh, governments centre-right governments have tried where they can to stay out of these fights because they're messy do they need to get more involved and if so how my personal view is that if you're putting your hope in education systems to cr create uh, people who, who share a, um, a traditional view of freedom, you're putting your hope in the wrong place. My view is that the best place to, to grow um, mature Australian citizens is in the family. And um, again, I go back to Abraham Lincoln and Winston Churchill. Neither men went to university. Both men were autodidacts. They, they learned themselves. Um, and they both presided over two massive wars where uh, democracy was ultimately triumphant. And so my point in mentioning them and the family is that what happens at home is the most important thing above all. And so empowering families, um, I think reducing the cost of living on families so that parents can spend more time with their children rather than having to hand them over to um, schools or, or daycare centres or, or what have you is really, really important. It's to give people choice. Um, it's to give people choice. A lot of people have to work, um, mums and dads have to work and they, they don't have a choice, but we've got to think about how we can strengthen the family unit because I think that's where the most important formative educational experiences happen. And the family's under attack, of course. I mean, you, 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 you're dead right in my view. I mean, Robert Menzies uh, spoke often and loudly about the importance of the family being essentially the fundamental building block of society. Uh, but it's been under attack from people like Black Lives Matter and all those organisations which see the nuclear family as a threat. Uh, 
perhaps we do need to be a bit more assertive, Andrew. What do you think? Well, I, I think so. I think it's, it's basic stuff, which I didn't appreciate as a kid, but I appreciate now. Sitting down together at the breakfast table every morning, sitting t- down together at the dinner table every night, um, and, and reading to, to my children, um, having conversations with my children. Uh, my boy, who's six now, Jonathan, he's got so many questions um, about the world. He's asking questions about the Taliban. Um, I'm having to explain all these things. And um, you know, what he learns at school is, is important, but uh, you know, at home is where the magic happens, which why a lot of these activists are so opposed to the family. If they can cleave parents from their children, then they can reshape the minds of, of the young and um, reshape our, our future. So um, yes, the family is under attack and uh, parents, first of all, need to, to take charge of their own sovereignty in their, in their home, I think. That's, that's, that's the most important message, I would say. Before we go, there's one, there's one standing issue in these conversations, at least there has been for the last 18 months that we have to turn to, and that is COVID, the, the uh, coronavirus. It struck me recently that Robert Menzies, when he gave his Forgotten People speech in 1942, May 42, it was the darkest moment of World War II. Uh, It was uh, only weeks after the bombing of Darwin. The um, submarines were about, would would enter Sydney Harbour two weeks later. We were fighting uh, a battle, an almost existential battle, if you like, in the Pacific with the Americans. And yet, of course, he didn't talk about that at all in his speech. I think he made a passing reference to it. But that what he was talking about was what happened after the war. And that's challenged me to think that perhaps that's what we should be doing right now, thinking more about what we do after COVID, what lessons we learn, how we restore the freedoms which we've, uh, we've surrendered in, in the cause of fighting this. Have you got any big takeaway thoughts around that what are we learned in covid what do we need to focus on next well i think one of the things we need to do is work on the relationship between uh, governments and and the people they serve i think the that that relationship has been stressed by pandemic and um i think every mp and senator uh, federally and and at the state level territory level and indeed local governments would be feeling this as well um, our institutions, our, our, our mediating institutions are under a lot of pressure. Um, and so I think we, we can do more work there. I think from a national strategic perspective, resilience is really, really important. Last year, the Henry Jackson Society uh, released a report which looked at Five Eyes dependency on China. Australia was the most dependent on China uh, for, for critical supplies of, of all the Five Eyes countries. So um, there are some things we just can't live without and, um, you know, a basic level of advanced manufacturing is, is absolutely critical, particularly for producing um, vaccines and, and other essential medical supplies in, in a pandemic. Um, I listened to a, a podcast recently that John Anderson did. I love John, um, great friend. And it was with um, Professor Carl Truman um, on the rise and triumph of the modern self. And he talked about uh, the present being somewhat analogous to the Reformation. The Reformation, of course, led to 100 years of, of civil strife and, and war. And it was spurred on by the printing press. There were lots of pamphlets being printed, a lot of new information, a lot of new ideas, a lot of energy. And he said today, with the rise of the internet, the social media, um, we're seeing the same sorts of argument and debate in the public square, but um, the quantum is much, much greater. Um, hundredfold, thousandfold, a millionfold, it's hard to gauge. Uh, but we're starting to see some of the same pressure um, in our system that we saw in the Reformation. And I think one of the things I'd like to see is you know, a, a policy response to particularly the rise of big tech and the influence they have over our civil discourse and the public square, because there's a lot of negative energy out there. There's a lot of people shouting at each other. And of course, the algorithms which, uh, which drive these big tech platforms like Facebook or Twitter, uh, and which of course um, lead to profits for them, um, they actually accelerate you know, the, the worst part of our, our, our nature and instinct. And, and that's not healthy for democracy long-term. And that's something that we need to turn our minds to. Andrew, thank you very much for your contribution 
this afternoon uh, and your contribution to Parliament and indeed your service for the country. And we ho hope that you'll join us again soon on the Water Cooler Conversation. Thanks, thanks, Nick. Always a pleasure.